good afternoon. Thank you for attending. Uh, welcome to um, the uh, sixth uh, Tufts Judicial Series uh, presented by the Tufts Lawyers Association. Uh, today we're featuring um, Judge Guy Cole, uh, a judge with the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, my name is Tom Dunn. I'm a partner at the law firm of Pierce Atwood. I practice commercial litigation and construction law in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. I graduated in 2000 um, and currently the uh, president of the Tufts Lawyers Association. Uh, TLA is a nonprofit corporation uh, founded almost 20 years ago. Our members are Tufts alumni who either graduated law school or are presently in law school. There's no membership fee, um, and, but we do maintain an opt-in directory on our website. Uh, Amy, I think you'll put into the chat room uh, the website information and, and ways to get involved and, and learn more about TLA, including my email address. Uh, we have uh, different regional sections uh, throughout the country, including New England, New York, uh, West Coast, and Washington, D.C. Um, we started this series featuring our uh, judicial members um, primarily because, you know, they've accomplished uh, a very high level uh, in their legal career um, and, and have a very interesting background. Um, this is the sixth one we've done. It's the first one we've done with an appellate court judge. So I think that that'll be an interesting perspective. Um, but um, they've been um, very interesting and thank you for attending. Um, I'm gonna be asking questions today uh, with Judge Cole um, with my uh, co-host, uh, Steve Wormill. Uh, Steve is a 1972 graduate from Tufts, um, same year as Judge Cole. Uh, he's a professor of practice at American University, Washington College of Law where he teaches constitutional law, First Amendment, and Section 1983 litigation. Uh, after Tufts, Steve spent uh, 20 years as a newspaper reporter uh, covering um, uh, the uh, Supreme Court um, uh, for a number of years uh, for the Wall Street Journal. Um, he has now been uh, teaching law for about 30 years. And among other writings, he's a co-author of two books about the um, uh, late uh, Justice Brennan, including the authorized biography published in 2010. Uh, he was recently the public president of the Tufts Alumni Association from 2018 to 2020. Uh, following Steve's introduction of Judge Cole, we'll engage in a conversation with Judge Cole for approximately um, 45 minutes uh, until about 10 minutes before the end of the hour. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'll do my best to uh, get to them. Uh, with 10 minutes left, we'll conclude uh, the recording and engage in more, uh, more informal question, question and answer and networking. Um, Steve, thank you for joining us today and please uh, introduce uh, Judge Cole and, and start the questioning. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for, for putting this series together. I haven't made all of them, but I really enjoyed the few that I have. And Amy, thanks for your efforts. Um, it's an honor to be with my classmate, Judge Guy Cole, uh, also a member of the class of 72. Um, he'll tell us a little bit about his background, but he grew up in Birmingham and then in New Haven. Um, he uh, graduated, as I said, from Tufts in 72, but he started Tufts, and he'll tell us more about this as well, uh, as a pre-med student, um, which you might now figure out didn't work out so well. Um, he then went to Yale Law School, uh, moved to Columbus, Ohio, where he has been ever since, uh, in private practice for a number of years, then moved back to D.C. for two years as, to do a stint in the Justice Department, uh, and then back to Columbus to his firm. Um, he became a federal bankruptcy judge in the Southern District of Ohio um, in 1986, and did a six year stint in that capacity, again, back to his firm in Columbus, and then um, joined the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit in 1995, uh, and became chief judge of the Sixth Circuit from 2014 to, uh, I think you said April 2021 was, was the end of your tenure as chief judge, but is now still in active service uh, as a member of the Sixth Circuit. So he's had a remarkable career, has seen a lot and done a lot, and we're going to try to ask him some questions to share some of that background and experience with us. So let me jump right in. 
Judge, just uh, just to start, tell us a little bit about your experience growing up and 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 leading to Tufts. Great. Well, first, let me uh, thank all of you. Um, uh, TLA, of course, uh, you know, Tom and Steve, I appreciate what you are doing with TLA. And it's a, a very uh, worthy uh, association. And um, I'm looking forward to, you know, further future participation in, in activities. Um, I note that I've got some classmates who are uh, on the call, uh, Rick and Steve, of course, and Chip Stanback, uh, I count as a classmate, and I'll make a, a, a pledge that uh, if you don't ask any questions or raise any uh, uh, things that occur back in our youth, uh, freshman, sophomore year, uh, then I won't uh, recall any events uh, uh, that you guys were involved in uh, back in that time period. Uh, but really, thank thank you all, and I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to to join you this afternoon, early evening. Um, so, uh, you know, my path to law and um, being on the bench, I think, really does start uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, you know, I was born in uh, in Birmingham in 1951, and lived in an area that came to be known as Dynamite Hill. Uh, because that's where a lot of the bombings occurred of homes of civil rights leaders uh, in the mid to late 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, Dynamite Hill is where Dr. King usually stayed when he came to Birmingham as a young uh, emerging civil rights leader. Um, and he spent uh, most of his uh, evenings with uh, very close friends who lived two doors away. Uh, so uh, I do have recollection as a, as, as a young kid, really, of sort of what was going on around me in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, 1962, uh, we moved to New Haven, Connecticut, uh, largely because my parents wanted better educational opportunities. You can imagine uh, what uh, life was like in schools uh, in, in Birmingham for, you know, Black kids back in the 1950s, totally segregated. In fact, all of uh, life in, in, in Birmingham was segregated. So we moved to uh, New Haven, uh, uh, and my parents hoped for sort of a better uh, opportunity for the three of us uh, educationally. Uh, and I think that paid off. Uh, I, you know, attended public schools until about the middle of 10th grade and uh, my parents talked me into uh, transferring to a nearby uh, private school. I was a day student at a, at a uh, largely boarding school. But it was there uh, in talking with the guidance counselors that I first learned about Tufts. And I was thinking about college, not too far away from New Haven, wanted something about the size of Tufts. Uh, I visited uh, a number of colleges in the New England area. I didn't look beyond uh, New England. And I, I had a college visit at Tufts on a beautiful snowy day and the snow was just falling and it just captured, uh, you know, uh, my, my, my attention. And I can remember, you know, driving up the hill with my parents. I, uh, I started uh, Tufts as Rick and Steve and Chip can uh, tell you, 1968, which, uh, my goodness, uh, was a year of great change in this country. And um, uh, the, the campuses were just uh, rife with student uh, activism and activity, uh, 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 advocacy for social change, for civil rights, uh, things of that nature. So I, along with other students, uh, you know, participated in the call for more justice in this country, uh, you know, in peaceful ways. And um, uh, really, it, it was a, quite a time to be in college anywhere, uh, I think. And, uh, but at the same time, I was like any other college student, uh, you know, enjoyed meeting friends like Rick and, 
and, and, and Chip and Steve and others who may be on, on the call, uh, enjoy campus life, you know, went to parties and did things that college students uh, do that they don't necessarily, you know, tell their parents about uh, when they go home. Uh, all lawful, everything uh, 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 legal, uh, of course, <laughs> mostly. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, and, and so uh, it was, I enjoyed the four years. It really was a, a wonderful place uh, to, go to, to go to college. So, Judge, about those four years after pre-med uh, didn't didn't seem like the direction you wanted to go. What about Tufts and your experience at Tufts? You know, helped prepare you for, you know, your legal studies and then you know becoming an attorney and and eventually leading to the bench. Yeah, I um, I think it was about uh, sophomore year, early uh, junior year that I began to look away from the sort of the world of science and medicine to the world of law. Uh, you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a lawyer, but I was pretty sure I wanted to be um, in, the, in the legal world. I, I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't have any relatives that I could think of at that time anyway, who were lawyers. And my vision of, of a lawyer was, you know, what you see on TV, uh, really. But uh, I began taking courses that um, I thought would give me a good foundation for going into law starting uh, maybe my first semester of junior year, focused on political science and history, uh, writing and English and things of, of that sort, and began just thinking about law school. But I, I was thinking about it in terms of... Um, you know, going to law school and sort of figuring out uh, once I got to law school, what I would do with a, a law degree. I wasn't one of those people, maybe Steve, knowing Steve, he knew he was going to be a constitutional law professor, probably freshman year, or sophomore year. Uh, Rick probably knew he was going to be an esteemed uh, bankruptcy uh, attorney uh, uh, around that time. I was still really trying to figure out uh, what I wanted to do. But I really did have great professors and, and I took really good courses. Students in my classes were very bright and, and engaging. And so I felt that Tufts was a great platform uh, for me to kind of build upon um, what I uh, wanted to, to do uh, you know, in, the, in the legal profession. And um, I mostly applied to law schools you know, within a day's drive of of, of uh, New Haven, uh, mostly Northeast and East Coast law schools. And I, I picked uh, Yale because I, I thought it offered, um, you know, a, a chance to be involved in, in, in sort of policy aspects. It seemed to have a focus on, on things like that as opposed to maybe uh, just getting out and being in the, in the practice. But I, I really, uh, I enjoyed my, my four years at Tufts, and I thought that uh, the, the coursework, uh, the guidance counselor, uh, career counselor I talked to about, uh, you know, medicine versus uh, law and, and other things, just were all, you know, very positive aspects of my time at Tufts. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about the career highlights and maybe what stands out to you. Um, private practice, uh, stint at the Justice Department, bankruptcy court, Sixth Circuit, chief judge of the Sixth Circuit. Is there something, is there one, one thing that in, in particular stands out? Well, we, you know, when you, uh, you know, list all those things, the first thing that comes to mind is somebody, you know, who can't hold a job, uh, <laughs> can't decide what, what he wants to do when he, when he grows up. Uh, and I, I, I'm still working on that as much uh, mentorship and and uh, quote unquote advice. Uh, I give my over 100 law clerks and you know my three kids who selectively have listened to me over the years. Um, you know, I really have enjoyed uh, uh, all of the positions. I, I I really have. I I in many there are many days I wish I'd started my career and just stayed at one place and built upon whatever it was I started doing. I wouldn't have had to pack 
boxes all the time and move from one job to the next job, kind of figure these new jobs out. Um, you know, just uh, constantly uh, sort of getting reoriented, but it's just uh, off as a curiosity or uh, I just had an interest in, in trying different things. I actually loved working at the law firm where I started in 1975, big, big, biggest firm in Columbus and probably close to 400 lawyers right now with offices in a number of different cities. And I really did enjoy the time there, but I just wanted to try something else. So I enjoyed the two years at, at DOJ uh, in DC and love my six years in the bankruptcy court. But I would say really the highlight has been my uh, almost 26 years on the Sixth Circuit. And, um, and really my time as, as chief judge, which I concluded about four or five months ago. Um, my time on the circuit has just given me a chance to work on matters of um, great you know, importance to society, challenging issues. Um, you know, even after all of this time, I, I, I never get a case where I feel that I'm bored or, you know, really seen this a hundred times. I mean, every sentencing appeal, for example, there's something different about it. Uh, every immigration case, uh, again, there are different facts and circumstances, not to mention all the constitutional issues that, uh, Steve, you're so steeped in and, and, and teach so well. Uh, and, and so it's just been, it's been, it's been the highlight of my career. So speaking of challenging issues and uh, uh, issues of importance to society, and this is, this is a distant observation. I, I can't say that I follow all of the circuits all of the time, but I do pay a fair amount of attention. And it seems to me, and I don't think I'm alone in this, that the Sixth Circuit has had deeper, um, louder, let's say, divisions over issues like abortion and affirmative action. They've divided all of the circuits, but, but for some reason we see those divisions in the Sixth Circuit more than, than in other circuits. Can you talk about that at all? Or? Sure, sure. I, I, I can give you some thoughts about that. And these are just my observations. I, I don't have any empirical data to support much of this, but it's a very interesting circuit uh, because it's number one, it's big, uh, you know, four large states, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. You've got two northern states and two southern states. Uh, and you've got the people in those states and the judges who come from the widest spectrum of backgrounds, uh, from major uh, metropolitan areas to small rural areas. Uh, you know, we have a judge from uh, a small uh, town in Kentucky that has one, one traffic light, uh, a great, you know, wonderful colleague. So um, uh, the, the, the circuit really is uh, representative, I think, of the country at large, maybe more so than a lot of other circuits. So I think that's that's a, you know, one piece of it. Uh, and then just the, uh, you know, sheer number of cases we get and the sh sheer size of our court. The Ninth Circuit, of course, has the largest number of, of judges. Uh, and then the Fifth uh, has 17 active judges. And we're third in size with 16 active judges. But we're actually almost as big as the Ninth Circuit when you count our senior judges. We've had the fortune of having um, a number of judges, uh, really most of our judges who have not retired and taken senior status. So 10 senior judges, 16 active judges, that's a lot of personalities, different backgrounds, different <laughs> views um, on the world. And a lot of these cases, big cases have, for one reason or another, landed in our court. I mean, the, 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 the biggest of the, uh, you know, a lot of the abortion cases, uh, uh, civil rights cases, um, huge criminal uh, conspiracies, like a lot of regions we have, you know, we're on the spine of a lot of uh, drug activity in terms of drugs being transported. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, the en banc cases that uh, 
uh, you hear so much about, uh, most chief judges will tell you are not their favorite thing to do. Can you imagine presiding over a court with uh, 15 other judges? I mean, I, some of you have appeared before, you know, uh, in bank courts and you know, that's a daunting task. Well, it's also daunting for the chief judge trying to keep everybody, you know, sort of uh, rowing in the, all the judges the same direction. I think the most difficult case, Steve, uh, in my time in the court, uh, uh, speaking for myself, I, I know that my clerks who worked in this time period, I think of most of the judges who are around would say that uh, were the University of Michigan, quote unquote, affirmative action cases for the undergrad right. school and the law school. Um, I, I've never felt so much tension um, in the roving room before we went out to hear the cases. And then as the cases were argued, uh, and of course I can't you know, discuss the, uh, our, you know, uh, what people said in the conference, but just, you just felt the enormity of, of the issue. Um, and the, um, you know, that case, the, the sort of the specter of it lasted for a long time. It was a very difficult case for the court. Um, you know, and those, and the cases that have, you know, impact on why societal norms are just, they're difficult cases for the court. I mean, we're, we're, we're judges, but we're human beings. And, and you know, we, we saw these riddles, these difficult uh, issues as best we can, but, uh, you know, our job is to render legal decision. And there are so many other aspects of that decision that impact society. So, so Judge, uh, you shared with us in preparing for this that you're the recipient this year of the American Inns of Court Professionalism Award, um, partially, mostly because of your service as a chief judge for the six circuits. Um, we had received a question from one of our attendees um, that I want to ask you, uh, it says, since you recently finished your term as chief judge, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the role of the chief judge, if any, in mediating differences amongst, amongst ju judges on an ideological divided court in order to maintain institutional credibility, consistency, as well as facilitate collegiality. Can you share your thoughts on that? And what I know you've done quite a bit in, the, in those efforts. Yeah, that's a... That's an, that's an awesome question. I, I commend uh, the, the person who submitted it because it goes to the heart of what uh, we do as judges and, and, and working on a large court, a multi-judge court. Um, so I'll, I'll see if I can keep all uh, sort of aspects of the question in mind, but prompt me, Tom, if I miss something. Um, when I became chief judge in August of 2014. I was concerned uh, that as Steve mentioned, uh, our court had received national attention uh, for uh, being less than collegial. Um, and a lot of that came from uh, some of the dissenting opinions uh, that had been written. Uh, the Michigan cases or an example, if you recall, some of the separate writings in that case, some would say were, you know, pretty caustic. Um, and then if one side starts using, you know, sort of st strong language, then, you know, it's hard not to respond if you're being, feel that you're being uh, unfairly, uh, uh, you know, challenged uh, or attacked as, as an author. So, um, what I did was um, I decided to try to meet with each and every judge on the court. Uh, it took me months and months to do this, but I went in and, and, and met with judges and I essentially said, you know, sort of, you know, we can't, we can't live like this. We can't work like this. Uh, it's not just our working relationships that are challenged, but the public has to have confidence in what we do. And we will do our best work for the public and the parties if we have respect for one another uh, and an open mind um, concerning one another's opinions. And, 
as the questioner mentioned, it's really difficult when you feel strongly about something, whether you want to call it uh, ideological uh, viewpoint or just how you look at the record in the case, how you view the Constitution, how you interpret it, how you view the law. And you were very passionate about it. Sometimes someone's life hangs in the balance. In the abortion case, again, affirmative action, First Amendment, uh, right to confrontation under the Sixth Amendment, the 14th Amendment cases that we get. And you feel very, you're very passionate. And sometimes you're on opposite end of the spectrum. So I thought that by meeting with uh, the judges and essentially saying, the buck stops with me, if you have any problems with anything going on in this court or anything I'm doing, you give me a call and I'll respond. I may or may not agree with you, uh, but I'll tell you where I agree and where I don't agree. And I want you to know my commitment is to this institution, to the Sixth Circuit as a court and to the public. And I'm not gonna get involved in the little, you know, things that go on uh, between and among uh, judges. So that's, you know, time where uh, it started. Uh, what I thought I could do that would be tangible that would help uh, was, uh, was to get the judges together as often as we could. You know, the problem you have a large court where you have judges living in Traverse City and Detroit, Harbor Springs, Michigan, Memphis, uh, London, Kentucky, and Cleveland, Columbus, you know, you know, just go on and on. You, you, you sit, uh, uh, half the judges sit one week, half sit the other week, and we sit about eight weeks each. So 16, 14 to 16 weeks uh, uh, a year. Well, 26 judges, you, 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 it, it may be a year and a half before you sit with another judge. So it's, so my idea was to just put judges together. So before the uh, in banks, I'd uh, get us together, we'd have lunch. Uh, decided we needed to go back to having a retreat where we would have no uh, business items on the agenda. Uh, we would go back to having circuit conferences. We had not had some because of the budget. Um, I formed some committees that I thought would be helpful. One is the social committee that is a lot more than social. It brings everybody together, including court staff. So those are just some of the things I, I could go on and on, but uh, I did make collegiality my, my priority. Uh, because I thought everything else kind of flowed through collegiality. So, Judge, let me ask you about politics in, in two different contexts, if I may. Um, we, we can take them one at a time. But um, my, my first thought is it's often thought or said that you need to be incredibly well politically connected to become a federal judge and, and, and a federal appeals court judge. But I don't think that's your story. And so that's one question about politics as it relates to the judiciary. And if I may ask the second one, um, Chief Justice Roberts told us a few months back that there's no such thing as Trump judges and Obama judges, they're all federal judges and yet we watched Trump race to fill as many vacancies as he possibly could on the district and circuit courts. And we've watched, we're watching Biden do exactly the same thing as if they need to offset each other and counterbalance each other. So what do we take away from that and how does it affect you? That does it affect you on a, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, those are great points. Uh, and I think all of you, uh, you know, would agree with what Steve has said. And, uh, you know, what's happening in the courts is a reflection of what's going on in, uh, you know, society in general. I mean, I, I, I think most of us would agree um, that our society has, society has become uh, very partisan. It's very divided politically and culturally and in so many other ways. And I don't have uh, an answer to that aspect of it. So the, uh, but the first part of it is, um, it is not at all inaccurate or misguided to say that politics play a major role in any appointment of a federal judge. I mean, that's just the nature uh, of the process, but 
you know, as I've talked to judges over the years and, and Steve, I know you've done a lot of work with uh, uh, judges and various courts, you know, everyone's pathway to the bench is different. Uh, and many uh, uh, are on the bench because they had very strong political ties. They hopefully also had great qualifications. You're not going to end up on the bench unless you have some political connection at some point along the way because you need, uh, uh, you know, 50 plus one, uh, you know, in the Senate to, to, uh, to get uh, confirmed. Um, but you know, my route was one that um, I guess because I didn't plan to be on the federal bench, you know, early in my career, I wasn't really doing the things that, you know, I see other people doing now uh, to lay the groundwork to, to, to be on the bench. And I also didn't have just personally a strong interest in, in politics. I, you know, was busy trying to become a good lawyer. I uh, was uh, eventually became a bankruptcy lawyer. I'd see Rick Method, all kinds of conferences. And, and so in the world of bankruptcy, uh, I, I really, you know, just didn't, it and politics just did not intersect for me. Um, so I left the bankruptcy court at, I'd say like about age 40 or 41 and returned to my, my old law firm with the idea that I would uh, just stay at that firm for the balance of my career. I really wasn't looking at the federal bench. And um, I have to give credit to my predecessor, Judge Nathaniel Jones, truly a civil rights uh, icon before he went off the bench and a, a champion for justice even while on the bench. You know, he called me less than a year after I left uh, uh, the bankruptcy court and return uh, to law practice and uh, uh, began to, uh, it's like he cast, uh, he's a fisherman and he cast uh, the bait and, and uh, asked me, hey, would you think about uh, maybe serving as a, uh, uh, being a candidate, you know, a, a sort of in the, in the running to be uh, a, a, a nominee for the uh, uh, appellate bench? I said, well, not really. I just got back into practice. And, and then he said he was, thinking about uh, taking senior status and um, my name had come up a number of times and he, he uh, asked if I would think about it. And I said, I was honored, but no. And then over the course of the next uh, year or so, he and I had a number of conversations. So I kind of got in it that way. I eventually went to the um, managing partner of my law firm and talked about it and um, I decided I would go ahead and make, um, uh, give it a run, put my, my, my name in the, in the hat thinking, you know, I have as good a chance as anybody else. Uh, maybe not, but, <laughs> uh, but, but I was told early on by the, uh, the partner, managing partner of my firm, you're probably not going to get this because you don't have any political connection. Uh, but, but part of what I did was use, you know, leverage, you know, relationships I had with people in and outside the firm who did have political connections. And I just kind of built it block by block. Um, I you know, met with the senators eventually. One senator, Senator Glenn, became a big supporter. Uh, uh, senator De then Senator DeWine and I met a number of times. He's now governor of Ohio, just so he could get to know me and ultimately I was, I think, the last person standing. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, I, well, I won't say I wouldn't recommend it, but I, I, I think you, you, you enter uh, a pursuit like this with your eyes wide open because, you know, there's just so many unpredictable aspects of it all uh, with the, the pre-nomination, nomination process. It's invasive in terms of your, 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 your privacy. You've got to fill out all kinds of forms. Uh, so the second part of it is um, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to disagree with the Chief Justice uh, publicly and, and say that, uh, uh, that, that there are you know, no, you know, no Trump judges or Obama judges, uh, you know, but, but I do think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, new, it's a nuanced issue, right? I mean, I think every judge will tell you that he or she 
is doing their level best to decide each and every case that comes before them based upon the law, the record, um, and uh, uh, all, all the things that judges should consider. Uh, but we all come to the bench with uh, uh, our own uh, sort of philosophical bent, our own way of reading the, the Constitution, Steve. Uh, um, and, and so, you know, it's fair enough to say, right, that presidents appoint, you know, people who they think are going to decide cases kind of in line with their view of the law. So, um, so I, you know, it's a, I would just say it's very nuanced. I, I would add to that, though, in the wake of the uh, election this past fall, uh, I thought that uh, uh, federal judges appointed by you know, Republican and Democratic presidents handle the flurry of lawsuits. Uh, someone said it was over 80 in a way that I, I thought reflected uh, the best of the, of the courts, federal courts. And um, they, the courts showed that they were not beholden to any one uh, president or, or person and decided the cases uh, on the merits. But it's a tough, it's a tough issue. How, how you um, restore full confidence in the public when it comes to this whole thing about, you know, judges sort of being appointed by a certain president. You know, you read an, any kind of article now, it would say, you know, judge appointed by, you know, Trump, appointed by Clinton or whatever, as if that is, sort of has predetermined the outcome. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's a complicated nuanced issue. So, so Judge, you, you've talked about your upbringing in Birmingham and how that impacted your, your perspective, your, your, uh, your path. You've talked about justice quite a bit um, in the different times of your life. You mentioned judges are humans. Um, and, and that, um, you know, a champion for justice on the bench, that judges have their own bent um, as well. And we, we, TLA has been focused on doing programs on, on some of the, you know, current, um, you know, recognizing racism and, and racial disparities. We had a program with um, Tufts professor Sam Summers, um, who explained some of his research uh, that has been on juries and on on, on, on other legal decisions based on, on race and other factors. We had a really interesting um, presentation by uh, retired judge Tim Lewis, where he sh shared his thoughts on uh, a judiciary's role in confronting these issues. Uh, what are your thoughts? You know, I mean, wh what did you do as, as chief judge and uh, particularly on the appellate level, how have these issues, have, have some of these issues come up through appeals? Uh, I know in a recent trial that was in the news, um, there was repeated demands for a mistrial because there was a certain pastor in, 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 in the room and people said that might have been building an appeal um, for an unfair trial. Um, what, what, what's your thoughts on a judiciary's role in, in confronting disparities, whether racial, gender, or otherwise, um, implicit bias? Yeah, yeah. So uh, much of that is you know, handled by the, you know, educational arm of the courts, the Federal Judicial, Judicial Center in Washington. And so there are a lot of programs, I've been involved in some of them, many judges are, uh, that have been aimed at uh, issues uh, that, that uh, encompass um, racism, sexism, you know, uh, uh, other biases. Uh, uh, there have been programs dealing with implicit bias. Most of the judges have attended those, those uh, programs. Uh, uh, so I think that the educational arm of the federal courts uh, uh, there in the, uh, the uh, building next to Union Station, the uh, Thurgood Marshall building, has done a lot uh, to take on and tackle the uh, issue of racism through educational programs that the judges uh, attend. But, uh, each circuit has, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, decided to how it wants to handle matters. Uh, what I did as a chief judge is I uh, work with uh, my circuit executive and the other judges uh, 
uh, to, to try to address some of these issues. And one way was uh, we started an initiative that's a little bit different from a lot of the other uh, sort of inclusion and diversity issues. It's a little bit broader than, than some, but we have started that and it's been met with great success. We've got tangible guideposts. If you go to the Sixth Circuit website, you'll see IDEA uh, initiative and sort of sets forth uh, the various things uh, that, that we have done. Uh, I just spoke, I'm involved in bar association activities and other programs. Uh, I just I was gonna mention, I was a moderator in a program uh, called, it's a law and, law and Leadership Institute that's sort of related to the local bar association or state bar association. And uh, it dealt with uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, and we had four speakers from law firm, well, three from law firms, two from corporations, talking about what their uh, uh, businesses do to uh, not just uh, you know, promote diversity and inclusion, uh, but specific uh, programs and steps that they take to make sure they are accountable, to make sure um, that uh, uh, the, 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 the businesses they deal with are, and of course, companies, who are uh, retaining law firms have a lot of leverage. And many of them are using that leverage to ensure that uh, the lawyers who represent them come from the sort of backgrounds that are important to uh, those companies from you know, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, you know, uh, dis any number of marginalized disadvantaged uh, groups. And I, you know, the, the power of the purse uh, um, is, is a pretty, pretty important one. You know, in terms of um, like the circuit court, um, you know, we, we're really limited by the record, uh, by, by the law. I don't know that there is, you know, anything specific that, you know, we can do on case by case basis. Um, to address issues of inequity or lack of diversity, uh, uh, other than uh, you know, if we get a challenge, let's say in a, uh, a Batson challenge in a in a, a criminal case that uh, you know uh, black potential jurors have been um, uh, booted off the jury, not allowed to be seated on the jury. You know, we deal with that from a legal perspective, uh, but I hope that in terms of the programs we've all attended as judges, uh, our horizons have been broadened, so to speak. And, you know, we're able to uh, look at uh, situations that come before us in terms of the factual scenario of a, of a case to, you know, maybe have a better understanding of um, how, you know, someone from this group or that group felt or how there was a, uh, how they were treated. As, as with Steve, I, I taught uh, uh, Section 83 uh, seminars, Steve, you probably know, and he, Steve's much more of an expert than I am, but we dealt a lot with uh, uh, police interaction. And um, uh, these were the early, kind of early days of uh, uh, body cams and uh, cell phones and, and uh, uh, you know, it just is, it was really interesting in the classroom to begin this, you know, you start seeing my first 10 years in the court, 15 years in the court, it was all in the record, you know, the just sort of the cold testimony of what the police officers said they saw, what, what a motorist, let's say a minority modus said happened to her. But now, you know, that these matters are on camera, we're seeing a different side of it. And I think that that's also, um, you know, making it more apparent, you know, uh, what actually occurred in some interaction between uh, law enforcement and, and, and a citizen. So, so Judge, for our last question, um, we have uh, law students on this call. We may have some tough students. We have, um, you know, a, a wider range of, of attendees. And, you know, you mentioned that you've had uh, over a hundred law clerks um, and, and you mentioned mentorship, you know, I, I guess I'd, I'd like you to finish this on 
giving some advice to our attendees um, on you know what what opportunities you seized during your career, but also more importantly, what advice you might give to our, our attendees, um, how you maintain a relationship with your law clerks, um, who I know of, uh, Steve uh, Romilo told me some have become judges themselves, um, which, which must make you proud. Yes. So, so, so let, let us know some of your thoughts on mentorship and, and advice for, for some of the next generation. Yeah, so this is uh, this probably is the favorite part of, of my job. You know, people ask me, how many kids do you have? And I say, I've got 106, you know, not counting the three who grew up under the coal um, uh, roof. Uh, you know, when I count the uh, my clerks at the bankruptcy court and here, um, counting the four I have now, we're, we're at 106. I, I just, uh, it's, it's just incredibly rewarding and enjoyable. Um, you know, my clerks, uh, range in age from, you know, 25 to now there's some in their fifties. Uh, there are some on the bench, state court benches, federal benches, private practice, a uh, lot are in public service. I'd say Washington DC is the number one sort of destination for my clerks and justice department and impact litigation, things of, of that nature. But, you know, I, I am just, I, they sometimes call me, uh, well, they used to say I was their other dad. Now it's becoming their other, you know, granddad. Uh, time has gone on. Uh, I just enjoy uh, having four new clerks every year. It's one reason why I don't have a a, a career clerk. It would career, career, career clerk would probably make my life a little more easy in terms of transitioning every year from you know, uh, departing clerks to, to, to new clerks, but I enjoy having four new clerks every year uh, and just their enthusiasm, um, their excitement for the job. There's young lawyers there. So I would tell any young uh, law student or intern or, or lawyer uh, that uh, you don't have to have your whole career plotted out. I didn't. Uh, if you'd asked me at age 28 or 33 or 35, you know, whether I'd be doing what I'm doing now, I, I would not have even thought that I would be here. Uh, my view is that, I mean, I came to Columbus from the East Coast not knowing anyone. I came here to work at uh, a law firm, but I decided that I was going to be a part of the community and that I would make every effort to get involved in professional associations like you know bar groups, then I would get involved in charitable philanthropic um, associations. So I ended up being on the board of the cancer hospital and children's hospital here. Uh, that I get involved in community activities. I met a lot of people. You talk about networking. Well, we didn't even use the word networking back back then. It was just becoming uh, a member of. You know, hopefully a valued member of the community. It's just very important to me to, uh, I, I don't know that I have any wisdom, uh, but I do have a lot of years uh, under my belt. And I do enjoy, you know, have sort of the, uh, being a constant presence in the, in the lives of my law clerks. So I just had a clerk who, you know, was here for about three hours a day. It was wonderful seeing him. I kept thinking, I have work to do, but he was <laughs> he was driving. He's <laughs> he just finished a clerkship in 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 Brooklyn. A wonderful guy. He's taking a job out in uh, San Francisco, and he decided to drive on out. And so we spent my clerks and I spent the morning with them. I had lunch with them at my desk. Um, these are like my kids, and so my advice is, uh, you know, we're gonna have jobs. Excuse me, I hit this thing. You're going to have jobs that don't work out. You're going to work with, uh, you know, lawyers, bosses that, you know, you don't really have a um, great deal of um, uh, comfort. Uh, you know, you just, you got to be flexible. You have to be willing to try new and different things. And that's just what I've done. Uh, there's a lot of risk in that as opposed to just starting one job and staying with it. And that could be the right thing for a lot of people. Um, but, um, uh, and I would say if, for those who think they might wanna be a judge one day, there's not, there are benches other than the federal bench. I mean, the federal bench is great, um, but I think the state bench is 
wonderful. I mean, to be a state trial court judge, you get, that's where the action is. And, uh, or to, you know, working as a magistrate in the state or federal courts or, or district court judge. I mean, I go back and forth to my friends in the district court all the time and, and, you know, they love being trial judges. So there's so many different things. You're on mute, Steve. Sorry, my apology. Sorry. This has been absolutely fascinating and we thank you for the insights and the time. There's so many more things we could talk about and, and your career has been so interesting and, and, and important and, and wonderful and thanks for sharing it with us. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to Tom with uh, just a quick thanks for the TLA and Tom's hard work in organizing this. And Tom, why don't you move us along? Yeah, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Judge Cole. Uh, it was great, great having this discussion with you. And um, this will conclude the recorded portion of our program. Thank you. Well, I want to of you. Okay, we are, have 